Good morning and thank you for joining us. Today we're going to do some myth busting. Now, it is said that bananas can help with chalk brood. Some beekeepers swear by it, others say it's hocus pocus. So why don't we give it a go? I've never done it before and we'll see what the effect is on this poor hive that has a bad infestation of chalk brood. Come and have a look at this. I'm just pulling out the pest management tray down here and we have a bad case of chalk brood. Look at all these poor bees that were in their larvae stage. The, the fungus got hold of them. They turned into a chalky lump and that's why it gets called chalk brood. Now those have uh, been pulled out by the bees. They've been ejected down through the screen. Sometimes you'll see them on the landing board out the front and that is chalk brood. So, theory is we cut bananas, we put them on top of the brood nest, and it's a bit of a bomb in the hive. Some say it's an alarm pheromone, which causes the bees to go into this kind of frenzy and start cleaning their hive, pulling out all of that chalk brood. Some say bananas release uh, ethylene, which then reacts with the oxygen from the air, making ethylene oxide, which then uh, has a helping hand in getting rid of that fungus in your hive. Well, let's see whether this is hocus pocus or not. If you've used this before, chime in on the comments. Let us know if you've got a chalk brood infestation in one of your hives. Try it out. Let us know what it does. Now, together we can do some myth busting. What we're going to do is slice these, put them on top of the brood nest, and wait a month and see if the chalk brood problem goes away. Now, this is quite a, a bad infestation. It's really slowing down this colony. If you look in between the frames here, you can see the bee numbers are getting a little bit thin. They're still there, which is good. The uh, issue with the hive getting weak is other things like beetles will take over. A strong colony is the best defense against chalk brood. So what we need to do is nurse this colony back into action. If you have a look in the side window, there's bees there. There's still a thriving colony, but they're thin on the ground. So this chalk brood is really in terms of the numbers of bees they're able to have. Now, if you've got questions, put them in the comments below and we'll get to answering those. But we're basically going to go through a brood inspection, have a look at the frames. Then we're going to come back at once this has been in there for a month and have a look. So if you have a look at the hive next to it for comparison in the same location, we've got a lot more bees in the window, a lot more honey stored and they're looking much more healthy. It has been quite a slow time, a bit of a dearth in nectar. They are starting to bring in a little bit now. We're getting an autumn flow, which is nice, but they are all a little bit weak. Okay, so first things first, let's uh, open the hive. Now, I'm gonna jump right up here. I've got my smoker out already, and I'm gonna blow some good puffs right into the entrance of this hive and that's gonna calm them down a little bit. We've got a nice, beautiful, sunny day here, and that's the best time to do your brood inspections. You can't always get that, but a nice light wind sunny day is when your bees are usually the calmest. First of all, protect yourself. Make sure you've, if you're new to beekeeping, you're wearing a good bee suit, you've got your gloves, and you're minimizing the issues of stings. Give us a thumbs up if you can hear me okay. All sounding good seats from the sim. Okay, before we jump into questions, unless they're specifically on topic, let's go through with this chalk brood uh, banana myth busting procedure. <laughs> Actually, Cedar, just before you're doing it, the Tizza, who always tunes in every week, saying um, that they tried the banana trick. The queen died, but didn't know if that was even a connection or just a random kind of thing that happened. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Maybe the queen didn't like bananas. Getting my dips done up here. Okay, so first of all we're going to take off this roof and put it aside. I'm actually going to leave the inner cover on for the moment because we're inspecting the brood. We don't necessarily need to also inspect the flow frames. 
can be a fun thing to do and good education to see what's going on in there. But today, we're just going to leave it on. We're going to crack this box off and just rest it out the front here. So with my hive tool, I'm going to just pry all around. Now, typically what happens is they get nice and stuck and what you need to do is lever it up all the way around by putting your hive tool. In this case, I'm going to go underneath the excluder. So you can see a little position there and I'm just lifting like that. Now, I'm going to lift up and have a little look to see whether any of the frames are stuck to the excluder, which they are. And that's a common thing that can happen. So what I'm going to do is just pry them off like this. And then they drop off. The bees get really annoyed if you lift a whole lot of the frames up with the excluder. That looks good. Now I'm going to take the side windows out to give myself extra handles. But I don't really need it because I'm going to lift front to back. I'm trying to keep this box up so we don't squash any bees unnecessarily. And I can see the box is quite light. I'm just going to place this down on the end so we don't squash any bees. Just out the front here. Like that. Okay, so now I've got good access to the brood nest. The excluder decided to stay down after all. And we're just going to peel that off slowly. Nice and gentle. Having a quick look on the underside for the queen. Occasionally she can be there. You don't want to orphan her from the hive. So I'll just lean this excluder up like that. So if I have missed her, she can walk back in. Okay, next I'm going to pull out our brood frame and just have a look at it. You can see healthy numbers of bees here, which is good. So this hive has a fighting chance against the chalk brood. Blowing a bit of smoke on the frame I want to pull out because I don't want to squash any bees and it helps get them out of the way. Going sideways first, just to loosen up the frame. Otherwise, sometimes when you lift, you will lift the nails right out of your brood frame. So let's have a look here for chalk brood. I can see one, two, here. Might be hard to see. It's just back here at the end of the Jayhawk. See that chalky mummy down the bottom of the uh, cell there? That is a larvae that has ingested uh, spores from chalk brood, which can come in from the outside environment. And it's a mycelium called uh, Asco, Ascospherus apis. So what happens is that larvae will die and turn into a chalky little mummy and then eventually it'll go black and that's when it's spreading out more spores around the hive and the infestation continues. So first thing you do if you get chalk root is move your hive into the sun. They do better it's nice and sunny. However, this hive is already in the sun. So next, well, we're going to try this banana thing. But uh, if that doesn't work, what we're going to do is cut out a bunch of the old comb and give them some fresh new frames. And we may also introduce a new queen, which is hopefully having more hygienic traits. And the bees can then get in and clean out that chalk brood. Having a look on this side, I'm not seeing any chalk brood on this side. Some nice pollen there. They look at that bright yellow pollen. Absolutely beautiful. That bee's done an amazing job of collecting that pollen and scraping it off all its hairs and pushing it down to its pollen bags on its back legs. And then it's flown back with almost its body weight in pollen and nectar to the hive. And now it's looking for a good cell 
to store it in. Okay, also looking for signs of AFB, if we see any sunken duct cappings. But it looks like we have, oh, here we go, one more chalk brood. So we've got three or four on that side and one on this side. Not to be confused with pollen down here, which you can see these beautiful yellow uh, pollen stores, which they're fermenting into bee bread. There's also whites as well. Let's put this frame aside and have a look at another one. We're going to go through and have a look at a few frames and just ascertain the levels of chalk brood. Obviously we're seeing a lot in the tray that uh, hasn't been cleaned out for a month or so. And that means there must be a lot in the frames here, but that frame there um, wasn't too badly infested. Okay. Having a look at this next frame. A lot of brood there, which is good. So that's get, going to help boost the numbers and get the hive back to being strong. So it looks like this hive actually might be getting on top of it now. Isn't that beautiful to look in at their world and what they're doing? Can you see any chalk brood there? I'll have to have a little look. There's one in the centre. There is another one there. So we've got basically the levels of infestation are two or three chalk brood mummies per frame side at the moment. There's another one on this side, another one there. So it's one, two, three, four. Okay, counting four on this side. Five. And what we have here is a queen cell. Look at that. I want to have a look down there. This is a pretty old frame, so it can handle being tipped over. There's nothing in it yet, so it's a queen cup. If it had a really raggy edge, I would say it would have uh, had a queen emerge out of it, but it looks reasonably neat there, showing that they haven't actually used it for a queen yet. But it could be a good idea for this hive to supersede its queen and hopefully get some genetics that are more hygienic for cleaning out chalk brood. So as we're going, we're realizing there's so many factors here and this is why it'd be hard to prove whether the banana thing works or not because they might requeen themselves and that might mean that they get rid of the chalk brood problem on their own. Or they might uh, uh, just get on top of it as we're seeing they've kicked a whole lot out but there's not a huge infestation in here anymore so they might be on the way to solving it themselves with their current queen as they get stronger and more sources of nectar come in. So let's have a look at another one. But as said today we're doing some myth busting does the banana thing work or does it not? Obviously a test of one isn't enough to know that so if you have experience with the banana thing, then let us know. See if bananas in the hive actually helps uh, in getting rid of chalk brood. And we can do some citizen science here for anybody that's got chalk brood out there by following what we're about to do and seeing if it works for you. Okay. This one. What are we seeing? Seeing drone brood. See these big, um, big uh, more bullet shaped kind of brood here. That's the drone, the male bees. There's less of them in a hive, 600 or so. And the drones uh, don't do any work around the hive, it's said. There's a, look, look at this one here, this big black drone. They're bigger, more teddy bear shaped, their eyes connect together in the middle. There's a few on this curtain. They don't have stingers, so they're good ones to pick up and show the, uh, show the children. So you can pick up that drone. Whoops, didn't get it. it um, didn't want to be picked up. And you can, <laughs> look, it's like, no, no. Okay, so there's a chalk brood there and there. Thank you, Bianca. Well spotted. So we're consistently getting two to five 
chalk brood cells per frame side. So that's the level of infestation we've got. Let's put these frames back in and let's put the bananas on top. And then what we're gonna do is close it up for a month and check in and see how we went. What I'm gonna do is put these frames back in at a similar, uh, trying to keep the same order, if you like, because you can get into a situation where these will um, have connecting uh, variations in their comb. And if you push the comb parts together, then that can be a spot where the bees can't actually service and hive beetles can get in there and lay their eggs and you end up causing a, a bigger problem for the bees. These frames are nice and straight, which is good. I'm gonna blow a little bit of smoke in here, let them settle down a bit more. At first it agitates them, but then they calm. Reason being is I noticed a couple of them were just going for my hand. Smoking my hand is a good idea because that helps mask my own pheromone because I guess I'm like a mammal of a bear coming into their hive. So I want to disguise myself a bit from the bees. Frames going back in, nice and gentle. Trying not to squash any bees as we go. And here we go, back in again. So we've seen lots of brood, we're happy there's a laying queen. We didn't make an effort to find her, doesn't matter. As long as you can see presence of young larvae and brood, then we're happy we have a laying uh, queen. Okay. I'm just pushing the frames back together. And what I'm gonna do now is put what's called an eek on top. Now I've just made this from an old inner cover. I've just cut the center out. And what that's gonna do is provide a spacer so we can fit our bananas in without having them squashed directly under the excluder. It's not something I use very often, but it can also be useful as a bit of a shim if you need to put a feeder on top of the hive and things like that. Next, we need a knife. We need our bananas now. Just to be sure, we're gonna use two types of bananas. We've got the Cavendish here, and we've got some ladyfinger bananas as well. Oh, look at that one. That one's uh, had a split. Doesn't matter for this purpose. What we're gonna do is slice right down the center like this with our knife, and we're just going to lay them right on top of the frame. And let's just observe what happens to see whether the bees are alarmed at all by this sudden introduce of banana into their hive. Okay. They don't seem too alarmed at all. Maybe they're not ripe enough yet. Let's try this ladyfinger. This is a nice squishy old ladyfinger. Uh, and we're gonna put that right in the center like this. Again, we're not seeing any alarmed activity, which is interesting for a start, because it said, well, here we go. They're coming for a little nibble. They're going beautiful, thanks for breakfast. So, uh, it's said that bananas contain something that mimics one of their alarm pheromones, which means that it turns them into a frenzy and hopefully they get in there and do a better cleaning job. Now, we're not seeing a frenzy, we're just seeing happy bees going, hmm, this is nice and sweet. It's a bit like honey. Um, but let's see what happens over the coming months. What I'm gonna do now is put back on the excluder, put back on the top box. If you've got questions, put them in the comments below whether it be about chalk brood or about something different. I'm gonna shake these bees in. If you wanna get bees off something, you really gotta shake it with a vigorous shake. And that way, those bees won't get squashed. On top of there is going our honey super. So these can be heavy. This one isn't because it doesn't have a whole lot of honey. This hive is weak, so I can quite easily just pick that up. But if it is a bit hard for you to lift your super, then just get help from a friend when you need to lift it. Okay, so there we have 
the brood box. The super back in place. And all we need to do now is put our roof back on and wait one month to know whether this banana thing is a myth or not. Of course, it's only a test of one, so help us out there if you've got a hive with chalk brood. At the beginning we showed you what that looked like. Have a look here at all of these poor chalk brood mummies that have gone down through the screen. It's a fungal infection. They ingest it, it can come from the bees bringing it in from wherever they're foraging from and it affects the larvae and turns them into a little chalky mummy. When it goes brown and black, that's when they're producing more spores. So we do need to clean that out so the spores don't end up reinfesting the hive. Any questions? Yes, Cedar, just actually on that tray that you've just pulled out, um, you did mention cleaning it. If you clean it, can you just wash it or does do you have to do something more to actually kill the, the, the fungi, whatever's in there? That's a great question. Now, beekeepers will often burn frames that are infested with a lot of chalk brood for the reason of really getting rid of that fungus. So it'd be a good idea if you have a fireplace or something like that to scrape all of that chalk brood out into the fire. That way you know it's going to uh, be burnt and not be hanging around producing spores for your bees. Seed, another question about, could you just cut the sections out that were containing the chalk brood in the, in the brood frames? Um, I guess some beekeepers do get in there and pull out every chalk brood they see, so that could be a good thing to do, and that, because when it's in the white phase it hasn't actually produced its spores yet. So a good idea to get rid of it before it's producing more spores, infecting more young larvae. Best defence against chalk brood is a strong colony, so if we can get this colony back to some really good numbers, the chances are they'll look after the problem and it'll go away. And, and see, do the bananas you use, everyone could see them, but just do they have to be quite ripe, those bananas, or doesn't it matter? I've never done this before, so I don't know. In this case, we used <laughs> reasonably ripe ones and very ripe ones, but as time goes on, in a day or so, they're going to get riper anyway, so they'll turn black, they'll be, leasy, they'll be releasing a lot of ethylene, which is said to mix with oxygen, which is said to, to help with uh, the chalk brood as well. But all of this has not been scientifically proven and with citizen science, hopefully we can get more answers and know whether it's helpful or not. Great, there's an interesting one, um, Melissa's come in, um, not sure where about Melissa is, but saying that they'd had chalk brood, they'd, they'd found that what they ended up doing was they gave the bees less in ventilation and they must have a classic hive because then they put the core flute flush with the mesh um, and did a few other things and now they have no chalk brood. How uh, interesting. Yeah. Some, some beekeepers would say the other way around, give your bees more ventilation to help dry out any moisture in their hive and that it would be better for chalk brood. So whatever works um, for you, beekeeping is a classic thing where almost everything people say is correct in a given situation. So it's a case of experimenting and find out what helps, what works, and the idea is whatever you're doing, you're trying to nurse your colonies back into being really productive and in good health, plenty of numbers, and that's what keeps most of the problems away. Stephen's asking, um, Cita, how long would that chalk brood have been in that tray for? So it's been in there a month. We're a bit remiss to leave it that long because as the spores, uh, as those chalk mummies turn grey and black, that's when they're releasing more spores. So we really do need to get them out, clean that out, put it back in. And then we can also see how many mummies are falling through and get a bit of a measure of the level of infestation going forward. And, and another one from Stephen as well, actually, he's just wondering because obviously we've all had a lot of rain. I think um, Stephen's in southeast Queensland and numbers are down um, due to this rain. And do you think that would have also, you know, um, made the hives get more chalk brood as well? I think certainly. There's two things that happen with the rain. One is a lot of moisture, which does tend to increase infestations of things like chalk brood. And also, it it often washes the nectar out of the flowers. So we've had the paperbark flowering down here in the valley below, below which is 
a great thing and the rain actually sets it off, but more rain washes the nectar right out of the flowers and then the bees don't get to, to bring that nectar in. So it's been nice to have a few sunny days here where the bees can get out and forage. Yesterday afternoon, you could see the nectar all around the cells in the, the rear window view here as they were drying out that nectar and condensing it and going through their amazing process of making honey. But in the morning, it's not there, but this afternoon, I would expect to see that nectar splashed around all the cells as they're drying it out again. However, we do have more rain coming, apparently tomorrow, so we could do with a bit more rain. That was a bit of a joke. We've had way too much rain, intense flooding disasters here in this area, which I've already told you about. So uh, hopefully the rain doesn't last too long this time. So because of the, the Flow Hive 2 and the 2 Plus and you've got the tray and then obviously the classic has the core flute slider. Um, if you didn't see those mummies, could, would you, ins does, it, does it really show that you need to inspect your brood box basically and how often to just check for things like chalk brood? Okay, so if you don't have a, a pest management tray like that, then look at your landing board early in the morning. You can tell a lot from early in the morning because that's when the undertakers are doing the job of bringing out the dead. Now, here it's already late in the day. The bees have all gotten up and done their job of removing any chalk brood that's sitting on the landing board. That's typically what they're trying to do. But because we've got a screen bottom board with a fairly generous size orifices in it, those mummies have fallen right through into the tray. But in the morning, you should see them also on the landing board. And if you're seeing that, then that's a sign of chalk brood. Uh, and so is chalk brood something that is also not just um, in Australia? Is it, is it for all beekeepers? Chime in if you have the answer to that. I believe it's everywhere in the world, but I'm not sure. I suspect that the drier areas would have it a lot less often, and the more humid, moist, rainy areas would have more presence of it. It's a fungus, and funguses like that moist damp environment. Great. So this is a question not about chalk brood, but this one's Chris just saying he's installed a second brood box um, and has moved some of the brood frames from the first brood box and found that they are storing all the honey in the new frames in the second brood box, but no brood. Is that because eventually they'll move that honey up into the super and use the second brood box for brood? Typically bees just need a single box to have a, a big thriving colony. Now different beekeepers have different opinions on that. If you add up all the cells in the bottom box, there's plenty there for a queen to raise a really big colony and lay a few thousand eggs a day if she needs to. So what I find if you add a second brood box is, as you say, it typically gets used for honey. Now, I prefer to have honey stored in the flow frames because it's easier to harvest but some people like to keep a box of, of uh, conventional honey, honey frames as well. But you may find that what happens is the bees will use the centre frames in that second brood box and they'll tend to store a lot of honey along the edges and their brood will be in a taller kind of central fashion between the two. So that's a typical thing with a second brood box. It's, uh, I tend to like it in this configuration because it's just a bit easier not having to go through two whole brood boxes if you need to find the queen and things like that. Um, look, this is just Lewis. You've just asked a question here um, that you'd said you'd bought three flow hives in the last five years, and I'm sorry I can't see that question. So if you could just post that again, that'd be great. Um, the other thing is, is do how um, with the chalk brood if you're saying in a month's time, so will you just leave this now, Cedar, or? I will, I'll leave this to complete the experiment, leave it for a month and see if they will clean it out. Now, there's a few reasons for that. One is you want the bananas to do their thing and gas off, and if the theory is about the ethylene and the oxygen, then you want that to stay within the hive. So if you do have a, a, a cover in top with the plug in it, the inner cover, then leave that in place just to keep that ethylene inside the hive. Ethylene is the ripening gas that bananas emit and sometimes bananas are used to help other fruit ripen. And sometimes they'll use a, a synthetic ethylene to help ripen fruit uh, in their supermarket chains. 
but good old banana. And Bianca, who's on the camera today, was telling me so she's been drinking banana tea. Another interesting fact about bananas is <laughs> they are radioactive. They tend to draw up potassium, radioactive potassium, out of the ground. And there's a measurement which is actually a banana worth of... Uh, so if, if you get a, a, um, a measurement of radiation, one banana is actually a measurement of how much uh, radiation from that radioactive potassium. Quite interesting. I've tested it. I put a Geiger counter right in a bunch of bananas and it definitely picks up a bit. So there's something new. <laughs> so you know, uh, Michael's asking, tuning in from Perth and Western Australia, um, they want to get some honeycomb. Could they just place an empty frame um, into the super and wait for the bees to fill it so they can pull out a frame of honeycomb? Certainly could. Now, if you're, you're putting an empty frame in a blow hive super, it, it's just a, not quite set up for it, right? So what you find is when you take this window off, then you're immediately exposed to the bees because they'll be all flying out around the frame. And you also find the angle is a bit funny because the flow frames have a deeper cut for the mechanism, so you might need to chock it up at the top. Similarly, when you pull out this cover at the top, the bees will come out. Now, what you're really talking about is our hybrid. Our hybrid has a couple of frames at the end, and it's built for that, and just a small door with uh, three of our flow frames in the middle, or four for the larger size to match a 10 frame Langstroth. So you might want to consider getting a hybrid super to collect honeycomb on the edge. Or you can add a whole nother box or a whole nother, some people will purchase just a, a medium box, which is like a cut down super, put smaller frames in it specifically for connect, collecting honeycomb. Or under the roof here, you can take the cap out, the plug in the inner cover, and let them make honeycomb in the roof. Or you might like to contain that with say a Pyrex uh, glass dish so you can enjoy watching them build honeycomb in a more confined area. Might be a bit easier to clean up than having the whole roof full of honeycomb. But they'll only get up there and start building honeycomb when they've uh, got lots of bee numbers and there's lots of nectar coming in. Um, Lynn's saying, and also a couple of other people are saying that they've seen bees bringing out chalk brood from the hive. Um, but Lynn was saying she'd recently seen a bee dragging a white larvae and didn't know if, it, if the queen had killed a developing queen or the bee have maybe been cleaning out a mummified chalk brood. But it was white. Any ideas on that? Okay, so for all sorts of reasons, bees will drag larvae out. Now, if it was squishy and kind of um, fresh jelly looking, then it's not chalk brood. Chalk brood is very chalky and uh, it's quite easy to tell, whereas there could be some damaged larvae that needs to be ejected from the hive, and that damage could be caused by hive beetle larvae worming their way through the combs and damaging the brood, and the bees will then eject those. It could be the hive got stressed for some reason. Sometimes you'll transport a hive a long way and the bees will get stressed, and when you put the hive down, they'll eject a whole lot of larvae. It could be uh, in, in um, other countries you have things like the deformed wing disease, which um, we don't get here luckily, but that could be a reason why young bees before they're fully formed are being ejected from the hive. And there's probably other reasons. So it's pretty normal and don't be alarmed unless it's on a massive scale. If you are looking for chalk brood, then look for the chalky little um, lumps and mummies like we were showing you earlier. Great, and this is one we get a lot cedar. And what about windows in the brood box? Windows in the brood box would be nice. Um, hopefully one of these days we will be able to offer that as well. Stacey's in North Idaho and just got there, received their flow hive, so a little bit excited. But getting really high temperatures in summer um, this year, do they need to provide shade for the hive? Look, your bees will welcome, welcome shade if it's really hot, but beekeepers do keep bees out in the full sun like all of these. We get really hot days here in the summertime about 40 degrees Celsius and our bees are fine. They have an amazing ability to do air conditioning. One of the last jobs a bee gets in its short little life is flying out, collecting water, bringing it back to the hive. They'll fan that water and use evaporative cooling techniques to keep the hive and at an acceptable temperature to keep raising their young. So bees are resilient. However, it's really nice if you can get some shade, especially in the afternoon. 
in the summertime for your bees if you live in a really hot area. And sometimes that means just positioning your hive so there's a nice tree, uh, so the shade goes right across the hive in the afternoon. And in winter, the sun's at a different angle and it might shine in nicely on your hive and keep it nice and warm all day long. That's probably the ideal, but bees are quite resilient and they can handle full shade or full sun. Great, Cedar. Oh, sorry, I'm, it's getting a little bit hot, my computer, and it's having a little, a little moment. Um, sorry about that. No Cedar, so if, if, the, if the chalk brood, if you don't look after it and don't get on top of it, can it just wipe out your hive? Like, what's... What happens is it tends to weaken your hive because all of those bees that, that died are bees that aren't able to do their job and the numbers get lessened and it is a case of then the spores uh, producing more and it, and it goes downhill and it's typically not the end of your hive, typically something else will take over like the hive beetles at that point or some more opportunistic um, uh, pest that eventually is the demise of your colony. Right now mentioning those little hive beetles, John's asking, just wondering in the channel where, um, where you harvest the honey and it flows out, just noted there's a few hive beetles in there and just thought that that area was maybe secure um, and that the beetles couldn't get in there. Uh, any suggestion to remove and maintain that? Okay, keep an eye on that. Usually hive beetles can't get into the trough area, which is this area down here. I'll just open it up. Um, one thing you can do is make sure this cap is pushed all the way in, creating a seal between this yellow bit here and the cap uh, but keep an eye if it's just one of your frames that's doing that you could have some of the cells in there aren't fully closed so perhaps pop that frame out have a look and make sure all your cells are pushed down into the fully formed position because when they're pushed down it uh, stops the hive beetle getting through into the trough area now if you see they are all pushed down then you might like to have a look to see whether there's any defects in the frame parts. If there's a little bit missing, uh, sometimes you get that in injection moulding, you get what's called a short shot and you get a little piece missing and the hive beetles could be using that as an entry point. But most likely it's because you've got a few cells that are still sitting up. Good idea to remember when you're closing your frame after harvest just to leave that key in that uh, closing the frame position for a minute or two to really drive all those parts down into their correct position. Right. Cedar, Henry's asking, um, got the bees for the second year and they're just not moving up into the flow or taking to the flow frames. Got any tips and tricks on that one? Okay, the very best thing is a strong colony uh, coinciding with a great nectar flow. And then they're usually quite fast, however, if, um, if you've been waiting a long time and that's not happening, uh, compare that to other hives in the area and see if they're booming with numbers. You may have an issue where your queen is just a bit slow, not producing enough numbers, and they're not really needing to, to fill up this second box. Having said that, if you are getting a bit impatient, if your bees are ready for their super, then they're probably building a bit of comb on top of your brood frames. What you can do is scrape that off with your hive tool and just mash it into the frame surface, put that frame back in the window, and you can enjoy watching them recycle that wax uh, around in that area, and that can be a way to speed it up a little bit. However, you probably won't get any honey stores till you get a good nectar flow and the healthy amount of bees in your hive. I mean, isn't it amazing, Cedar, on that same topic? Then we've got Michael who's coming and saying, just got their flow hive in October, the first harvest last week, and they got 31 jars from six frames. Um, love the hive and has a super strong colony, so. Amazing, so yeah. that is actually the reason why we suggest having more than one hive, because even in this row, I just had a look yesterday, most of them are low on honey, but one is just about full. Why has that one uh, manage to find nectar and the rest not and it's simply a bit of a game of chance all of those scouts go out and they might have just looked a little bit further and gotten onto a really good nectar flow even up to 10 kilometers away so it's extraordinary what goes on in the world of bees and having more hives than one lets you benchmark what's going on you can more easily pick whether you have a, a weak colony that needs um, addressing you know, perhaps they need a new more virile queen or perhaps there's an issue like chalk brood 
affecting that colony and really dragging the numbers down and then you're not getting honey stores. So having a few colonies really helps and it also helps you fix problems because you can pull a frame out of another hive and introduce it to a queenless hive and if it's got young eggs or really young larvae on it they can raise a queen from that so that makes you uh, self-sufficient in that way rather than having to run off and find a queen from another beekeeper. Chuck's asking, Cedar, um, flow frames from last year are empty and wanting to put them back on, um, getting them ready to put back on. Do you need to wash them before putting them back on? It really depends. If they've been hanging around and they had a bit of nectar on them and it's gone a bit mouldy and the wax moth have gotten into them and the vermin and they need a bit of a clean, then by all means give it a clean with uh, uh, hot water or even a hot pressure washer if, if you can. That, that's the very um, best way to wash them. But generally the bees are pretty resilient and, and good at cleaning the, the frames also. So it might, it might just be a case of brushing any uh, uh, wax moth webs off them and putting them back into the hive for the bees to clean up and make their own again. Now, if you've stored them in a freezer, that's probably the best way to store them because they pretty much stay as they were and they're ready to go back on when you put the super back on. Here in this subtropical region, we can leave them on all year round, so we don't need to go through that phase. Great time yeah. for come yeah. more questions. Oh, so. good, good, because I thought this was a goodie actually. Uh, it's not about chalk brood, but it's about nukes, which a lot of people are obviously starting to get. Um, Sian got a five frame nuke. Um, and getting ready, getting it all ready before she uh, or they transfer it into the brood box. But just notice some small hive beetles. Is there anything I can treat the beetles with while they are in the nuke box? Aha, uh -huh. okay, so they're in a little nuke box and there's beetles. So that you can make various different types of traps and somewhere many moons ago we made a video of how to make various different hive beetle traps for your Flow Hive Classic. You might want to look up that one. But one of them is what's called a fluff trap. You can get uh, Chinese, um, or you know, typically it's, it's in, in those types of restaurants where they've got a, a vinyl, and on the underside of the vinyl there is a, a fluffy backing. Now that can be great for making hive beetle traps, but you do have to keep it away from the bees, so you'll need to use that strategically to stop your bees getting tangled because bees have spurs on their legs also and so do the hive beetles. And the hive beetles will actually get tangled up and die in that fluff trap. So that's one thing you can do. Uh, some people use chucks, those, uh, those throwaway dishcloths and they put them on top of their frames. I find the bees get caught in them as well as the hive beetles. So uh, you might lose a few bees if you're using that technique. There are lots of products on the market that can go down between the frames, uh, little hive beetle traps that'll fit in between the frames. That could be useful. If, um, but if the colony's strong and they've got enough bees to cover all the frame surfaces, they'll probably be fine as they are. And it's a case of transferring them into your flow hive. And if you've got the flow hive too, you can use the pest tray and some oil in there to continue to catch those beetles as your colony expands. Fantastic. And Lynn, who came back before and you talked about that they'd seen a bee carrying out a big sort of bigger mummy bee, now realises that it was probably a queen because it was so much bigger than the actual the bee that was actually dragging it out. Okay, there could be a case of supersedia. Only once in my life have I seen the hive drag out the queen. So that's a, a rare and special moment. Also could be a drone, which are a bigger bee as well. Oh, and on that, see, the, um, someone tuned in before and said, can the, drone, the drones get through the queen excluder? They can't. So the queen excluder also excludes the drones from getting up into this area. It doesn't matter if they do get up into this area. In fact, some hives are run without a queen excluder at all, but it's very queen specific. Some queens will lay in flow frames and some queens won't. It'd be nice if, you, if they didn't and then you wouldn't need to put the queen excluder in place because a queen excluder also does slow down your bees in terms of getting up through that excluder and putting honey in these stores. Some people will remove the excluder so the bees will start working their flow frames quicker and then reintroduce it if they need to later. Zeta, could you keep a flow hive in a greenhouse? 
you'd want to leave that open to the wide world because bees need an incredible amount of forage. They are foraging on up to a 10 kilometre radius. A hive like this could visit 50 million flowers in the day. Probably not this hive because it's a bit weak, but that is an extraordinary number of flowers and you're not going to be able to provide that in a greenhouse. So while you could put them in there, they need a way out into the wide world to do some good foraging and bring up back enough stores to keep that hive going. Cedar, this is sort of the last question on the chalk brood one. Just with the bananas, do you always have to put them on top of the brood rather than on top of the super? Like, could you put them up in the roof cavity? Okay, it's very experimental, so try <laughs> and see what works for you. Now, we could have done both. We could have put bananas up on top of the flow frames as well. But in this case, we did an experiment where we're putting it directly on top of the brood nest. My thinking there was that it'll be nice and close to where the problem is and hopefully cause a bit of a frenzy of activity, a bit of an alarm, and the bees will get in there and clean out all of those chalk brood cells and get rid of their spore load and the hive will pick up numbers and then be able to deal with the problem. So for those that are just tuning in, this was about myth busting. There is a, a, an idea, lots of people say it works, other people say it's hocus pocus, where you put bananas cut in half on top of the brood frames to help an infestation of chalk brood. So let's come back in a month and see whether it's fixed our problem or not. And if you have experience with this, let us know what works for you. And if you do have chalk brood, then please try it. Let's see if we can get some citizen science going and find out whether this is myth or whether it is true. Thank you very much for tuning in and let us know what you'd like us to cover in future live streams like this.